Whether it be through a crossroads in our lives or through daily supplication, each of us must experience what Christ taught when he was approached by Nicodemus. We must be born again. As we prayerfully immerse ourselves in the witnesses and records of the New Testament, may we reignite in ourselves a new spiritual birth. Only then can we see Christ's miraculous works for what they are, divine manifestations of love, glory, and purpose. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. I think we need to be born again because it's a necessary step for our eternal salvation and our um, path to becoming divine. I think we need to be born again because it just gives you a change of heart. I think that when you have that full change of heart and you really want to be committed to Christ, then the want to get to the celestial kingdom is going to be like the main factor in your life and that it will become more important to you. When I felt I've been born again is like every Sunday when I take the sacrament, it's like, I feel like it's kind of like a reset of like, okay, this is what I think I can work on. I'm gonna try and doing this better. And even if it's like, oh, I think I had a great week this, um, this week. It's like always just trying to strive to be better. I felt born again. Um, right after FSY, I was able to go this year, um, and just the amount of spiritual preparation that it gave me, I feel like I can fully trust the Lord and take the steps that I need to, to be able to walk in the covenant path so that I can return to Him again. Welcome everybody, my name is Ben Lomu and I am your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Jennifer Lane. Jennifer has a PhD in religion with an emphasis in history of Christianity from Claremont Graduate University. She was a professor of religious education at BYU Hawaii for 19 years and is currently part of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And our special guest today is Kevin Giddens. Kevin is a leadership coach and trainer. He is a former member of BYU Young Ambassadors and still dances and performs today. He and his wife, Lita, have five children. Kevin, so happy to have you here with us. Glad to be here as your special guest. <laughs> and we're also joined by our live studio audience. Thank you all very much for being here. And to the viewers at home, thanks for joining us. Please join us for further discussion online through any of our social media platforms. Today, we've selected two topics to discuss that relate to passages found in John chapters two through four. These topics and discussions support and build upon the Come Follow Me resource developed and published by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The two topics we're going to discuss are first, I must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And second, Christ's miracles show his love and glory. After exploring these two topics with our panel and studio audience, we'll move on to footnotes, the last segment of the show where we let our studio audience go and we dive deeper into the scriptures with just our panel. Okay, Jennifer, as we jump into this first topic, I must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. What can you teach us about the context of these chapters and how it relates to this first topic? Great. These are fabulous chapters. So we have in chapter two, the first miracle. All three chapters we'll be looking at, two, three, and four, are very early in his ministry. And we're seeing themes that run throughout the Gospel of John where in John chapter one, the prologue, we are introduced to Christ as the premortal Jehovah, as the creator of heaven and earth. And now we're seeing this theme of recreation, that he's come to help us become new creatures and this transformation that can happen. In these exchanges, we see a lot of dialogues and sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations that can teach us a lot about that personal connection. Well, the cool thing about this is that for me, Faith precedes the miracle. He's not going around showing off, doing these, doing these. He is actually performing his works with those who believe. And we learned in John 2.11 that the disciples' faith was strengthened because of these miracles. So he's doing miracles for those who believe. Well, I, th I think the, the point that Kevin made, it's really important to understand the story because um, we're, the setting is at a wedding, but the invitation to the miracle comes from his mother. Okay. So talking about someone who has faith in him, I think probably our mothers have as much faith in us as anybody does. 
And I, this is true for the Savior as well. So they're at a wedding. She seems to have some, some position of responsibility as hosting. And so at, at a celebration, they would want to have enough wine for all of the guests. And so in verse three, you say, they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. So this is a situation and she knows, she has confidence that her son can help. And so Christ gives the direction, filling these water pots with water. They do it. And then when they draw it out, it's not water anymore, mm -hmm. it's wine. And so he's done something beyond human capacity that points to what he can do in transforming us to something that we wouldn't be without his help. For me, before the miracle, he had me at the door. The fact that he showed up to a wedding shows that this is, a, this is not a deity that's untouchable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He thought enough to go to the wedding, yeah. to be social. It was not like he was some untouchable yeah. being. And so coming to the a wedding, to party with everyone, to enjoy, <laughs> and yeah. to be obedient to his mom, say, hey, we, we're out of wine. And said, okay, mom, I'll hook you up and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll do this. Right. And, and what I yeah. discovered in the scriptures, it wasn't just little pictures. He actually performed a miracle with They're 150 enormous. gallons yeah. of wine. Yeah. You know, that's a big feat. Yeah. So Kevin, uh, you're in the business of, of training leaders. Uh, what sort of leadership qualities do you see within this first miracle? A, a great sense of leadership is one that allows others to share in leadership. It's called inclusive leader. He was being inclusive, allowing his mother to take leadership mm. at this. Not that, I mean, he's Jesus Christ. <laughs> he, he is the, uh, de part of deity. He could have taken over and made the instructions, but he allowed his mother to share in that leadership. And that's a great sign of a leader who allows others to share in leadership. Yeah. What does Jesus changing the water to wine teach you about his power and ability to change us? Edna. I am not the same that I used to be when I was young. I did not have the strong faith that through the years I have developed, coming to read more about his life, accepting him as my savior has changed me. You know, now just even lately, I mean, I'm an old woman. I have come to finally tell him, Lord, thy will be done. It is not mine. And I have to go for that. I have to trust him. So, because he knows much better what my life can be with his help. It's a little bit difficult still, even though I love him, but I need to trust him daily in all aspects of my life. So I do feel that change in me, it's the water on the wine. What was the triggering point that started this change for you? Trials. Trials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. With my, um, my middle son, he had cancer at the age of three and a half years old. I remember one night as I was putting him in his crib, telling the Lord, Lord, if you want him, if he's not to stay on earth with me, I appreciate the time that you have given him with me. If you need to take him back, it is okay with me. And from there on, Quite a few other things have happened. He did heal him, but he wanted for our family, not only myself, uh, it helped a lot of us grow closer to our Savior and to be able to relate more as a family mm -hmm. and grow stronger. You know, I, I love what Edna's sharing about how through this miracle, Christ shows that he does have the power to, to change us. Even when things get really, really difficult, we can change and turn to him. And this leads us into the next part of, of what we're talking about today with Nicodemus. Jennifer, do you mind giving us some background and who was Nicodemus and, and what is he seeking and what does the Savior teach him? With Nicodemus, we, we learn from verse one that he was a Pharisee. But at this point in this story, he comes to the Savior saying, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. The miracles have been seen. No man can do these miracles which thou doest except God be with him. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the, the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus is just kind of like, what are you talking about? And, and so his initial question is, I'm too old to be born again. Like I can't get it back to my mom's womb. Right, like this. He's thinking literally about birth. And then Christ clarifies, he said, Jesus in verse five, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot 
cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then sort of making the distinction between physical birth and this rebirth, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. And then he clarifies a little bit more, I think in verse eight, to another kind of life, a life that we start to live when we listen and feel and are moved by the Holy Ghost. This is something that's meant a lot for me, realizing that there's that other dimension to life that comes when you have the Holy Ghost. Well, first of all, Nicodemus is my man because <laughs> I've interacted with a lot of learned men and sometimes too much education is a terrible thing. Mm. <laughs> and Nicodemus was inquisitive, he wanted to learn. And to me, it tells me that first of all, it's a process. Okay. Nicodemus had to go through a process. He didn't get it all of a sudden. And if you talk about anyone who's been born again or converted, you'll realize the, the moment happens, but it happens gradually. So okay. there's a process. So he's going through, Jesus has taken Nicodemus through this process to learn and to grow, conversion is a process. And we get to do it continually. Every Sunday when we take the sacrament, we get to renew ourselves mm. and continue to be converted over and over again. Uh, so you have a lot uh, in common with, with Nicodemus and this search and, and this invitation to change. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your story and how you came to, to find the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Well, for me, it really started in a foster home. So I was, I'm a product of a foster care system in New York City. I was raised in the Jones family. My father was Catholic, my mother was Baptist, but because my mother is the, the matriarch of the family, we ended up going to the Baptist church. But I, the thing about that I remember, I remember missionaries knocking on our door. Uh, I was about 12 or 13, and my mother said, tell them we're Baptist. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant by <laughs> telling them we're Baptist as opposed to, you know, I thought all Christians were the same. Mm -hmm. And as the missionaries left, I'm telling you, Ben, I felt the spirit something saying, Kevin, they had something. And I felt a loss that I had to send them away. And I didn't have that, didn't recognize that feeling again until I got associated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I left home, left New York, left New Jersey, went to school in Ohio. And that was the first time I recognized that he was aware of me. I wanted to go to Ohio State University, big football team. I was at a big game going, go Buckeyes, go Buckeyes. And someone said, Kevin, this is not the Buckeyes, it's the Bobcats. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I was at the wrong college. <laughs> and by the fact of me going to the wrong school, I had experiences at that university that had I went to Ohio State, it would have been the wrong place. Mm -hmm. God knew where I needed to be. And I recognized that God had a hand in where I went to college. I left college, went to, I, was, I graduated in dance, the arts, fine arts, communication and dance. I was at Opryland and Grand Ole Opry, their lead dancer. And I realized I was not living my life the way my mother taught me. Mm. My mother called and I couldn't tell her where I was going out with the cast after a party. And I said, you know what, Kevin, you're not living the, white, the same life your mother taught you as a Christian. And so I realized I needed to give up the entertainment industry because I thought it was, it was not for me. Mm -hmm. So I came to BYU not knowing what was going on. But the cool thing about this, Ben, is the Lord led me to Utah because I remember driving to Utah, not awake. My fraternity brothers heard that Utah was a dry state, so I was drunk, hungover. I was taking substances I shouldn't have taken, and the Lord literally drove my car from Ohio to Utah because I remember waking up thinking, welcome to Kansas, or welcome to the next state. The Holy Spirit drove me to Utah. And when I got here, I met the young ambassadors, and after about two months, I joined the church. I was so excited to hear about the plan of salvation and all this stuff. When I was in the font, I didn't want to get out of that font. I was splashing around, thank you, Jesus, thank you. I was, those Mormons didn't know how to hit them. They got a Baptist. But I was splashing in water because I felt that the Lord literally brought me here, literally. Jennifer, don't you feel that excitement yes. as he's explaining that? I got goosebumps as you're talking about that, just the joy, that excitement. And we see so many parallels with Kevin's story and with Nicodemus. To belong to a group and then to make that transition to feel that something, I imagine he felt something was missing that he was, in, he was seeking. Uh, what does this teach us about the, the bravery, the courage that Kevin displayed and, and Nicodemus as well? What does it teach us about him finding and seeking out Christ 
as a member of the Sanhedrin. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And what's intriguing with Nicodemus, and we'll see later with chapter four, that sometimes conversion stories are a quick turnaround. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a slow process. And Nicodemus actually is a little bit more of the slow process. Or the woman of the well, the Samaritan woman, she's she is like off to tell everybody about Jesus and life is different for her right away. With Nicodemus, we see this powerful teaching where the Savior is explaining his mission, that he's coming down from heaven and helping us understand who he is and what he's coming to do. But chapter three actually leaves us hanging <laughs> that we don't know. And it's only later in the gospels that we realize that he, in a position of power, having been touched by his interaction with the Savior, then speaks up for him. And then later at his death, he acts on his behalf. And so we can see evidences of it having been changed and moved upon, but it's a little bit more subtle. And I think that some people, it is a quick turnaround. The, the being born again, they can point to a moment. And Elder Bednar talked about this. Sometimes it's like a light switch. And other times it's like a dimmer switch. Okay. And the light is gradually coming on and you can see more the the in-between stages. And other people, it's from like night to day. And so for me, I think about Nicodemus more like a little bit of the dimmer switch, that it's sort of over the, these years, he's the things he's experienced are working on him. And then he acts to follow and to speak up and to use his position to testify of the Savior later on. You know, it was a, when I was in Ohio, I discovered that there's a God. When I was in Tennessee, I realized I need to change my behavior. And so when I came to Utah, people may have thought it was a snap, but the process had started long before I was exposed to what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Ellen LeGrand Richards talks about uh, the importance of what it means to be born again. He said, I bear my testimony, my brethren and sisters, that there is nothing in this world to compare to the love of God and the testimony of the truth that comes through being born again and knowing the things that matter and are worthwhile. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts with us on this first topic and from the audience. Uh, thank you very much for adding a spirit to this discussion. And to the viewers at home, what witness can you give of Christ because you have been born again? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. Christ, I believe, performed so many miracles because it's just kind of who He is. And I feel like He's always wanting to bless us. And if that means by miracles and like, so be it. I think that's more of his personality more than anything. Christ performs so many miracles because he loves us and he wants to help us. He's our brother and wants to show us that love. I feel like he was driven by his compassion to help people in need. Um, there's probably lots more that happened that we didn't ever see or know about just because he was so loving and wanted to help people. The love never ends and the people that he loves never ends. And so he'll never stop performing those miracles because he will always be showing that love. Miracles are in the simple things of looking at, you know, the earth, uh, waking up the sun, rising again. Uh, when you have a chance to use your priesthood power to heal people, that's a miracle. I think miracles, we underestimate them. There are many types of miracles. And all you have to do is open your eyes, open your ears and look to see God's miracle today. The second topic we're gonna to discuss today is Christ's miracles show his love and glory. From these chapters, we have a very well-known uh, scripture, a very well-known verse, uh, John 3, 16. Yeah. Uh, can we go there and read that and talk about how God manifests his love to us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The message of the Gospel of John is this witness that Jesus mm -hmm. Christ has come to save us and that through faith in him, whosoever believeth, that that faith in Christ allows us to have new life in him and that that witness just goes all the way through the Gospel of John. Kevin, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, we, we have this example of God uh, showing how much he loves us uh, through sending his son. What does that mean to you as a father? I love my sons and the idea of having to give them up, the sacrifice, knowing what they're gonna go through, that says a lot mm -hmm. because Father in Heaven knew what Jesus Christ had to go through. Jesus Christ also knew what he had to go through. He was willing to go through it. So for any parent to have to give up a child, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. 
I would love to hear from the audience and get your thoughts on how has God expressed his love to you? Nick. I think for me in my life, it's always the feeling that I'm never alone and I'm never have to be like abandoned. For a large part of my childhood, I grew up in a Russian orphanage and I was told every day when to get up, when to eat, how much to eat, when to use the bathroom. And you know, my life was very militaristic. And it wasn't until an old farm boy from Idaho, my dad uh, was in that temple one day and the spirit of the Lord told him, your boys are in Russia. And he decided that he was gonna follow that prompting because he loved God. And he decided that he was going to fly halfway across the world to a country he had never been to before, to a language he didn't speak, and to people he didn't know, hoping and praying that through the love of not only our Heavenly Father and our Savior, but he'd be able to find his son. That is, what a fascinating story. I, I'm super intrigued now by what you just said. So just give us a little taste of what is life like now for you that you've experienced God's love through what your dad did? You know, in the orphanage, you had kids that didn't have a mom or a dad or grandma or grandpa or even siblings or close relatives. They were completely alone and abandoned, kind of forced to live this life alone. And who do you, who do you rely on and who do you trust? And the fact that Heavenly Father knew that I needed a young man from Idaho to fly halfway across the world to remind me my worth and my value. Being raised without knowing who your parents are, uh, not knowing, having anyone that looked like you, not feeling like, and as Nick said, alone, and then discovering the gospel of Jesus Christ where he says, well, I'm your brother, mm -hmm. and you have a father who actually loves you. And to have that sense of family, uh, your eternal family is very rewarding. Realizing that this earth is just temporary, but eternally I have a family is wonderful. And then later finding my family, my biological family, is, is just now I have an earthly family, I have a heavenly family. It's a wonderful feeling to belong. Well, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jennifer, as part of this, of, of verse 16, we're told that because God loved the world so much, he sent his son so that whoever believes in him, that's where eternal life is gonna come from. And we have this wonderful teaching moment as the savior is traveling through, he comes across a well, he meets a woman in Samaria. Can you give us a little bit of a detail on that and what he's trying to teach about his role in helping us gain eternal life? Yeah. And I think is, is making the connection here to chapter four, this theme of choosing to believe that that life that Christ wants to give us is there. And then we see the Samaritan woman who's there at the well, Christ comes to her and asks for water, give me to drink. And in verse nine, she's really quite surprised because normally drinking out of something that she had touched would have normally the Jews wouldn't do that. So why are you asking thou being a Jew, asks us a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then we see this search to turn, and this is where we go back to where Christ testifies of himself. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Now, of course, just like Nicodemus, she's initially thinking of this in terms of physical reality, not spiritual reality. And so she's like, how in the world could you give me water? You have done anything to pull out with. Mm -hmm. So the well is deep. From <laughs> whence then hast thou that living water? Like, you've got to be kidding. And Christ, again, in verse 13, he continues to testify of himself and the new life that he can give. Whosoever, in comparison here, whosoever drinketh of this water, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And at this point, she's interested, but she still is not quite understanding. Because you look at verse 15 and 16, part of what I think she's thinking about, she respects him more, but what she's looking for is to have her daily burdens lightened. And she's thinking better in terms of less physical manual labor. Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. But Christ wants her to know that he's gonna ask something more of her, which he's, he's gonna ask is for her to change. But to change, we have to recognize that where we're at isn't good enough. Where he says, go, call thy husband and come hither. And then she's like, um, well, <laughs> I have no husband. And Christ, of course, knows being 
Jehovah, mm -hmm. <laughs> he knows not only is the person that she's living with not her husband, they're not married, but that she's had multiple marriages. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating to me, if you go to verse 19, is that she doesn't get offended. What she says instead is verse 19, the woman said unto him, sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. And so now she's seeking, she's, she's moved to another level. She's changing, she's continuing to have the humility to be willing to change, to be willing to learn. And what he teaches is, Really, I think that worship is a way of being rather than just a place. And so he talks in verse 23 about worshiping, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. And so she is being drawn towards, invited into this higher, holier way of being. And at this point, she's looking ahead and she says, I know that there's going to be this Messiah who's called the Christ. And at that point, as she's listening, as she's learning, Christ is able to testify of himself in very direct terms in verse 26. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And in Greek, it's even more powerful because the term I am, he that speak unto thee, is actually the language from Moses speaking to Jehovah in Exodus 3, where I am is the name of God. So he is not only saying I'm the Messiah, he's also identifying himself as Jehovah. This is an extraordinary witness. But the fact that she keeps learning, she keeps listening, she's not resentful, she's not angry, she's humble, she is able to receive this witness and that's transformative for her. This is a very special story because as a Samaritan, she felt marginalized. Mm -hmm. Often as a black man, I feel marginalized, mm -hmm. my family feels marginalized. And the fact that Jesus said, I'm gonna give you water that, that you won't thirst. For us, water is everything, it's life. And Wanting to be accepted in life is a big thing. And Christ is saying to her, acceptance of the world is one thing, but acceptance of me, I accept you. And for us and our family, knowing that we're marginalized or we feel marginalized, seeking acceptance from the world, and knowing from this story, as he accepted this Samaritan who Jews looked down on, Christ accepted her, he accepts us, and he's giving us an acceptance that goes beyond this world. Uh, that's, a, that's a big thing for us, mm -hmm. to be accepted by Christ, and knowing that despite the world, we're accepted by Christ. So Kevin, you mentioned earlier how a faith precedes the miracle, yet our faith is also strengthened by Christ's miracles. Can you speak to you a little bit about how we can strengthen our faith through those miracles? My family and I, I'd say we have strong faith in Jesus Christ, but then seeing a miracle strengthens it. We've lived in several places, and I've actually, like Lehi and Sariah, was told to leave Ohio, move to Utah. Why Utah? I don't know. <laughs> we left our house, was not sold. Left. I was on a tenure track position with one year before I got tenure, I left that job, moved to Utah without a job, without a house, thinking, Father, why are we here? Within months, I had a job, we had a house. To me, that was a miracle. And our faith was strengthened, that we know if the Lord sends us or tells us to go somewhere, we're going, sign us up. <laughs> a similar experience where, where my husband and I had the, a similar feeling. And I think that is this having the confidence that from the past that when the Lord prompts you to do something, you do it, and he will prepare a way, gives you confidence that the next time to be willing to do that. And so just as we had had, had a feeling we should apply for work at Teach at BYU Hawaii, we were there for 19 years, it was amazing. But the time came where we felt like we need to be back. We had family here with certain situations, we needed to be back. And having the, the courage to move ahead with that, not knowing you know, how all the pieces would come together, mm -hmm. and then moving it forward, trusting this was, was the right thing, but not knowing exactly what it looked like, and then seeing things fall into place, work opportunities, housing. And sometimes people move forward and the things don't necessarily fall into place right away. And so it's not necessarily a guarantee, but I do know that my own experience has been with, with we trust the Lord and we're doing his work, that he makes it possible for us to accomplish what he wants us to do. And all of this uh, is just, additional manifestations of how much God truly does love us. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts and insights on this second topic about Christ's miracles showing his love for us. And from the audience, thanks again for your comments and for bringing the spirit with you today. 
And for those at home, we still have so much to cover from these chapters in the Gospel of John with Jennifer and Kevin in footnotes. Stay tuned. The Spirit communicates to me using thoughts and feelings that have hit me through my heart and my mind to know that what I'm doing is right and what I feel like I'm doing is right. For me, how I hear the Spirit is it's just a little voice in my head that's very different from my own thoughts and it just it keeps reoccurring. If I don't listen the first time, it'll keep coming. And it's something that I'm not even thinking about or that um, doesn't seem like something that I would want to do. Sometimes uh, Holy Ghost talks to me through ideas pop into my head or strong feelings that I feel that I should do or I shouldn't do. And also through the people and some people do stuff for me and I feel that is love from God. It's very interesting because like you know your internal dialogue and what's you and then I feel like there's also like a, a companion with it's almost like as if I'm having a conversation like oh is this good and, I, and then I feel like oh this isn't very good or oh yeah this is good and um, that's how I feel like the Spirit communicates with me. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about John chapters two through four with Jennifer and Kevin. Okay, I would love to revisit a little bit about our discussion on being born again. And uh, there's one part that I'm kind of curious about, and I hope you can shed some uh, a little bit of insight on this. Uh, so if we go down, we have this in chapter three, we have this discussion with Nicodemus, and there's this little dialogue going back and forth. And at one point in verse 10, Jesus is getting this sense that Nicodemus is not understanding what he's mm-hmm. talking about. I get the impression that he's chiding him a little bit. He says, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? As a teaching moment, what is the Savior trying to uh, help Nicodemus understand by telling him this? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think it's another example of where we've seen this pattern of sometimes the Savior gives us chance to have trust in him, not taking offense. I mean, I think <laughs> that this is a kind of thing where it would be easy to feel like you're being called out or scolded yeah. or to me, it, it, I think it, it shows, you know, whether he should have known it or not, one way or another, it's easy as human beings when we feel defensive to turn that into being hostile. And and then he proceeds to teach the gospel, to teach, to testify of his mission in a really powerful way. And and I appreciate Nicodemus not shutting down the conversation by walking off yeah. and in a huff. <laughs> but I think and, it also shows Nicodemus that, you know, you've got a doctorate. You're, you yeah. know, the scholar. And there's still something yeah. you can learn, bro, yeah. you know. Yeah, he's, he's and he was humble to say, him. okay, yeah. okay, there are some things I don't know. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this idea of being born again or this idea of, of going back and relearning or learning, there's more things to learn. Nicodemus was humble to yeah. accept that. Yeah. And that yeah. was really cool. And it's a great really... teaching moment to see how what Jesus is trying to show him, that you, you're looking at things from physical eyes. I'm trying to help you transition into think, seeing things from a spiritual standpoint, what it really means to be spiritually born again. What other aspects from this encounter or uh, of, of this conversation of Nicodemus and Jesus can we, can we learn, can we build upon that we perhaps didn't hit on earlier in the show? Well, I think even, it's interesting the term born again, for us as Latter-day Saints, I think this is going back a little ways, but up until, I think when we, we had the impetus to, to read the Book of Mormon more under President Benson and you get into the Book of Mormon, you realize, oh, being born again isn't just something that for other Christians, but this is the doctrine of Christ. Mm-hmm. Like this is the invitation of what he's come to do for us, that we can, I think, be more comfortable going into scripture and saying, this is for me, this is our message, this is this is the good news of the gospel. And I love the parallel with be, in verse 7, being born again, and then at the end of verse 8, Eight, kind of clarified a little bit about being born of the Spirit. I think that helps us understand that this is a process and that this is a, it's part of the gift that Christ is giving us is to have this new life in Him. I think the more we can embrace that message and then feel it, be, have it be alive in our lives, the more we really are appreciating the, the fullness of the gospel being restored. This is truly the good news. 
something you said that I think many people underestimate, this idea of being a new life in Christ. The cool thing about the Book of Mormon, which is another testament of Jesus Christ, is we have the Bible, which is these great accounts. Mm -hmm. But when we have the Book of Mormon being that second witness, in Mosiah chapter 5, verse 7, mm -hmm. it gives us more insight about this idea of being born again and being born of Christ. Yeah. If I could read it in Mosiah chapter 5, verse 7, and now... Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons, his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. This idea of being born again because I was born physically through my mom. I'm a spiritual child of the Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. And now I'm being born of Jesus Christ right. because I'm accepting him as my mm -hmm. savior because of his atonement. I'm now born of my mother, mm -hmm. but I'm also born of Christ. That's another rebirth. Yeah. So this high idea of being born again, I'm born again to Christ. And it is, and I think the Book of Mormon, the point you make here, doubles the witness. I mean, the, the Bible testifies, but the Book of Mormon testifies again and again and again of the reality of this process and that it's indispensable. And we see several examples from the scriptures. We see mm -hmm. Alma, his process of being born again. And then we see experiences like, like Paul. Do, do you have favorite experiences or favorite conversion stories from the scriptures? What I love about Alma's story is because we, we have this account where he just drills down and talks about how, what does faith look like? It's, it's recognizing you need to change. <laughs> And it's looking to the source of that change, where I cried within my heart, O Jesus, thou Son of God, have mercy on me. And he acknowledges his state, but by looking to Christ, he is able to, to start a new life, that the past is washed away. And he now is experiencing joy rather than being harrowed up by the memory of his sins, that his life is different. He is born again. He has a new life through his faith in Christ. And that is always there waiting for him, but he had to choose it. And I, I love that this account, it's so vivid about how it, the process happens. Alma 36 is set up in a, a chiasmus structure. Would you mind explaining that? Sure. Because I think it's important to understand what that structure teaches us, what Alma is trying to teach us, and how that connects with John 3.16. It's an ancient way. It, it made it, I think, easier for people to memorize things so that the structure builds and then it reverses and comes back the other direction. So if you look at the beginning of Alma 36, one and two, keep the commandments, you'll prosper, remember the captivity. And then he moves into God will support you in your trials. And then if you go to the end, you'll see the same, like it starts where it ends. If you keep the commandments, you'll prosper. And then the verse before that, brought out of captivity, remember, always remember. The pivot point mm -hmm. is the right focal here. Point. The focal point is Christ, which brings us back to John 3.16. Christ is the focal point. Christ is where our, our new life begins, yeah. looking to him and where we can turn. And so I think this visually maps out where everything that was can be undone and can be remade through looking to him and having life in him. And it's just kind of, it's a literary structure that, that reinforces the, mm -hmm. the message. I've learned to look to him for many things. You know, when you talk about conversion stories, it may sound weird, but for me, Alma is a great conversion story to see Alma's change, to see Paul's change, but I love to see Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Think about his conversion. When you mm -hmm. think about it, he had faith, and from a child mm -hmm. to his ministry, to wandering in the wilderness, fasting, being tempted, you look at his progression because conversion is a progression. Yeah. He had to have faith in his father. And so as he had faith in his father, I'm having faith in him. Mm -hmm. I look to him as an example because this idea of being born again is a process. Christ went through the process mm -hmm. to follow his Father's will. I go through a process to follow my Father's will, but also to follow Jesus Christ. And one of the things I learned that Elder Bednar teaches us is that this, I, this idea of process. Elder Bednar says, he says, quote, we begin this process of being born again through exercising faith in Jesus Christ, and Christ exercised faith in the Father, 
by repenting of our sins. Now, Jesus Christ didn't have to repent, mm -hmm. but he showed us the way of how to mm -hmm. do it by being baptized and being baptized by immersion for the mission of, of the sins. So Elder Bednar is telling us that this conversion is a process that yeah. we go through. And one of the coolest things is that Elder Todd Christofferson adds to it by saying, being born again requires both our own effort and the divine power. Mm -hmm. Christ's effort and his Father's effort, yeah. or my effort and the effort of Jesus Christ. And for most of us, it happens over time rather than all at once. And as you look at the life of Jesus Christ and seeing how he progressed, it was a process for him to become who he is. And it's a process for me as well. Yeah. And I follow that example of Jesus Christ by being baptized, recognizing who he is and having faith in him as he had faith in his father and following that guide. He is a perfect guide <laughs> if we would only follow it. And it took me a while to discover that. And we see that with the example of the woman at the well. Yeah. As, as you illustrated yeah. earlier, how for her, it was a process. Mm -hmm. and she's learning. And just by the way that she, she greets him, first as a Jew, mm -hmm. then calling him sir, mm -hmm. then a prophet, then, then the Christ. As we talk about conversion stories, I, I love how in this slow process, you know, we, we see examples of that through through history mm -hmm. and, and how it does it does take time. Yeah. And and I love that. And and especially with you know, with this woman, how just little by little she's learning and, and you know, we, we you brought up Paul earlier and how we have this this moment that Paul had on the road to Damascus when he was, you know, formerly when he was known as Saul, yet that was a moment. However, the Lord's hand was guiding him throughout his life. And I'm sure you experienced similar that similar process. As you, there is that moment where I think sometimes we can say this is where it really happened. But all along the way, we're being guided step by step. Yeah, and I think as you look at Paul's life or Alma's anyone's life, as you said, we're reading the moment that they got converted, mm -hmm. but we forget that the Lord had prepared the way. You know, there are prophets that help prepare the way. There are family members who are, take part in that, but literally God prepared the way for, for Paul. You know, I love how these stories can all kind of are intertwined. You know, we have this you know, this conversation with Nicodemus, and, and then we have this experience with the woman at the well and her process of, of being born again. And in addition to that, we also get this wonderful teaching about living water. What is the Savior trying to teach about having that living water? Yeah, and I think it, the fact that she is physically getting water that we need to survive. And mm -hmm. I think that the Lord it uses these, these images we can relate to. But what's so cool about this story is that she's just so focused on her immediate physical reality. And this is my job. This is what gives me access to life. What's fascinating is at the end of at least her story, not the end of the story, but end of her story where interacting with Christ, that in verse 28, she leaves the water pot and then she goes into the city and then starts to share the good news so that her focus has been on, I need to do this with my life, which is get water. Mm -hmm. And now it's just like, I'm leaving that and I need to do something new with my life, which is tell people about the living water. And tell the fact people that about she Christ. left it is like the fact that I don't need anymore because yeah. Christ is the living water. Yeah. So I'm leaving my pot because I don't need it. Yeah. That is a witness of, and of course we know she needs to drink, but, but I think it, it does point that way. It sort of symbolizes that she's found a life that's beyond physical life, that it transcends it and that she wants to let other people know about it as well. You know, something that um, living, what living water is, it's flowing, it's mm. moving. It's not stagnant. It's not stagnant like a pot of water would be. Mm -hmm. A pot of water is stagnant, and once you draw from it, it doesn't refill itself. But that living water, as uh, in verse 14, mm -hmm. uh, the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up. Yeah. Uh, into everlasting life. I love that imagery of it's never going to run out, that we have to try to create and develop. She's transitioning from a, a pot of water to a well of water that's never going to run out, that's going to lead her to everlasting life. And when I hear that, I yeah. always think of this idea of enduring well. Mm. When it's flowing, yes, I have bad days, but I should remember I've got a well of water. Mm -hmm. When I feel empty, I've got a well of water. And so 
I always feel like on fast and testimony times, we should be getting up like popcorn because we all should be sharing mm -hmm. how the Lord is keep flowing through our lives. Yeah. Yes, we have challenges, but we have a well that we can go back and tap through. Mm -hmm. So this idea of enduring, enduring well, it's because we've got a well yeah. to endure well. Yeah. Yes. You get it? No, enduring is. well yeah. with the well? <laughs> it, that it really is. I think it's the key. that it's, it's a lie that he wants to be with us through his spirit on a daily basis, no matter what comes up, that, that it's a living, active, interactive process rather than something that's just a boxed in like the the picture that it's there, but that it it's it's moving, it's alive, and it can adjust with like he'll be with us no matter where we're at as we as we seek him, he'll be there with us through his spirit and to know that we don't have to run dry. And there's an aspect of the story at the end that we didn't touch on earlier that I, I'd love to revisit where starting in verse 39 where she goes and and she starts to just share, you know, uh, the, this experience. And verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. In verse 39, they're believing, again, this process, they're believing on him for the saying of the woman because of through what she words. is saying. Through her words, they're starting to believe. So when this, in verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode, abode there two days and many more believed because of his word. So we see this transition and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the savior of the world. It, it's interesting, you know, as you were uh, sharing your, your conversion story, Kevin, talking about meeting some of the Latter-day Saints and, and initially that process of, okay, there's something about this. Because we can't ignore the fact that we have been given the charge to help bring people to Christ, but eventually you had to draw from that well the source yourself. And one of the great things I love, the missionaries that taught me, they always would use the phrase, but don't take our word for it, find out for yourself. Okay. And for me, that was reassuring yeah. that yes, sometimes we take the testimony of others, but we've got to find out for ourselves. When I was getting converted, it was this idea of this Book of Mormon versus the Bible. I was raised with the Bible. And how do I take my word for himself? And a wonderful scripture that has become one of my favorite scriptures in 2 Nephi, it tells me to focus on Christ. That's what I focus on. And I want to share it with you real quick. It's in 2 Nephi 33, verse 10. This is the reason why I said, fill the font. <laughs> I'm ready. It's because I'm thinking... The missionaries are telling me about this Book of Mormon. They're telling me about the Church of Jesus Christ, but ah, uh, what, what? And then when I read this, this is what it says. It's, it reads, And now, my beloved brethren, Kevin, and also Jew, and all ye ends of the earth, hearken unto the, these words, and believe in Christ. And if ye believe not in these words, the missionaries are telling you, just believe in Christ. And if ye believe in Christ, ye will believe in the words of the missionaries and the prophets of old, and the words of Paul and Alma, for they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto me, and they teach all men that they should do good. When I read that, that testified to me, my mother, she said, first thing she said, well, I said, mom, I'm excited, I'm gonna join this church. She said, well, Kevin, are there any black people in the church? I said, Mom, we're in Utah, <laughs> maybe in Georgia. And then she said, well, do they believe in Christ? I said, Mom, it's called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And she was testifying to me that despite the association of other blacks, despite the association of this or that, is it Christ's church? Mm -hmm. And this scripture testified, focus on Christ, yeah. everything else will fall, come into yeah. place. The source is going to be, as we individually look to Christ, no matter what we're struggling with, with the people around us, or, or whether it's things that we've, what experiences we've had, or things we learn, or, but it's, it's getting connected to Christ, that, that that is that tap of living water, that when we feel that, then we can come and we can go into our meetings and share the life that we feel in him with other people, rather than waiting and going, expecting them 
to fill us up, that we become sort of overflowing, abundant. We feel his love and we want to share with other people. And that is, I think, when we really are, that, that living water is flowing in us and we can bless other people. And, and not have to worry about where they're at and not let that be a barrier. And us. it's like Nicodemus and so many people did, it's seeking out Christ. My yeah. wife always tells me she's a great prophetess in our family, <laughs> but she says, look for Christ in all things. If I'm in a sacrament meeting and I'm not enjoying a talk, look for Christ. If I'm, if I'm at a, a function or wherever I am, always look for Christ because he is in all things yeah. and we'll find them. Touched me earlier when you said how Conversion to Christ is the key because there are going to be things in, in the church Amen. that if they don't line up with, you know, with what, you know, sits right. Because people are going to say things that may be offensive. And if you're converted to the church, you might have a tendency to be, well, I'm out. No. That's yeah, it. One of the things the scriptures yeah. teach us is nothing can separate me from God's love. Mm -hmm. Because as wonderful as Brigham Young was, there are some things that he said that people weren't happy about, mm -hmm. but it's not Brigham Young's church. Right. As wonderful as David was, David committed some sins, but he, you know, but you know, he was a king. Everyone's looking for a king. My king is Jesus Christ. So no matter what happens in the church, yeah. I really believe the church was set up by Jesus Christ. But it's run by men and women. They may make mistakes, they may say things you don't like. But who, where is my faith? Is my faith in them, a man, or is my faith in Christ? So I do separate. I am converted to Jesus Christ. I did convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I belong to Christ. Love that. I feel like we could go on and on talking about these, these chapters and these verses. It's been such a such a great conversation, and I've, I've learned a ton. As we wrap up, I want to ask both of you a, a question. I'll start with you, Jennifer. Uh, as you have, uh, have studied, uh, you've dedicated so much of your life to, to gospel scholarship. What has that done for you and added to your own personal testimony about Jesus Christ and his ability to save? And it has been a privilege. I you know, think of all of the years I had a chance teaching New Testament, teaching about Christ. And because when the Holy Ghost bears witness of Christ and when we testify, we feel that, that witness. And so I, part of it is the, the deepening, like you know, but then to have a deeper witness. But I think... As we have deeper witness, we also get pushed a little bit maybe into the darkness, right? Mm -hmm. We get pushed into doing new things, doing scary things. But because we trust Christ, we talk about going into like, this growth zone. Where we're going out of our comfort zone, mm -hmm. into a growth zone. And I think that the Savior keep we're growing spiritually as he's recreating us. And so I've seen in my own life that I get comfortable and then I have this feeling okay, something else is going to happen. <laughs> what do I need to do now? I'm going to have, whether it's a new calling or a new responsibility or something, and it's going to be hard, but knowing, having felt that the Lord was with me and helped me, it's like, this is going to be new, but, but, but having that confidence that he wants to be with us and that because we have covenants, because of the gift of the Holy Ghost, that he'll be with us through that moving into that, like, step into the darkness, move into the growth zone, mm -hmm. that we're not alone. And I think that that's the, that he's been able to help me keep, and, and I'm sure we're gonna have many more mm -hmm. steps forward, but that he will keep walking with me is the witness that I have. And Kevin, uh, your story and your conversion is, it's just, it's so inspirational. And I, I loved hearing about it. Uh, what message would you give to uh, members of the church that are perhaps feeling a bit marginalized, what message would you give to them uh, to encourage them uh, as they're going through their own journey? Well, one, just reading about Jesus Christ to realize that he was marginalized by so many people and that he came to earth to go through what he went through to let us know that he understands. He was the only one that can atone for our sins. He's the only one that understands. And so for me, Looking and reading about Jesus Christ helps me to understand more about what I'm going through because he's the example. We're talking about him through these books, but he is a real person. He's, he is someone who I have a relationship, and the more that I'm converted time and time again, my relationship with him grows. And so, yes, at times I feel marginalized, but so did he. Mm -hmm. Yes, at times I feel that I'm alone, but so that when he was in the 
wilderness, he was alone. Mm -hmm. And so he's someone that I look to to gain strength. It really is going back to that well and getting more and more strength and more power from the well. Well, you're both an inspiration and both wonderful examples. So thank you so much for sharing with us your thoughts, oh. your insights, and your testimonies. Privilege. And thank you at home for joining us for this discussion from John chapters two through four. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions you've received. For video clips, original artwork, and more, visit byutv.org slash come follow up. In our discussion next week, we'll be studying Matthew chapter five, Luke chapter six, lasting happiness and eternal potential. Thank you for watching. <laughs>